Okay, I'm actually going to take the carburetor <laughs> off the Oldsmobile. I've been procrastinating a bit because the carburetor. Who does carburetors? Nobody. All right, well, I want to keep the car original, so no Holly fuel injection conversions for this guy. So modern cars have fuel injection where there's a computer and that computer tells each cylinder, uh, it, it, it sniffs the exhaust gases, it senses the throttle position, it does all these calculations a billion times a second, and it spurts the exact right amount of gasoline into each cylinder at the exact right moment. This car has a carburetor. This car does not have a computer to control anything. You know, as a matter of fact, maybe I should, throughout the course of this video, I should put 1951 facts up on the screen. Uh, things that happened in 1951. And one of the things that happened in 1951, the year this car was made, is the very first commercial computer was installed and it was used by the United States uh, uh, Census Bureau, and it was called the Univac. So anyway, the very first computer was just getting started doing a thousand calculations a second, and uh, that's the year this car came out. So no computers on here controlling anything like uh, fuel injection. It's a carburetor, and that means it's a device that has a bunch of little chambers and floats and uh, valves and needles and all of that crap and it uses a bunch of different little bits of vacuum to meter the amount of fuel that it dumps in to where it distributes through this uh, intake manifold so we're going to take off and and this is an oil bath air filter uh i'll put a link to the last video where I show how to service this properly. And when I take this off, I'm not gonna undo the wing nut, which look at that, I found a wing nut. I'm an old man with a bunch of uh, plastic tubs full of parts. I found a wing nut that fits. So you don't need to take the wing nut off. You need to loosen up this little uh, thing right here. And then when you take it off, remember there's a pint of oil in there so keep it level and set it somewhere nice and flat. Next, I'm going to go around and disconnect any of the uh, other connections that come to, into it, like this one right here. My fuel coming in right here. Looks like I have a manual choke cable which I'll have to disconnect so I'll go around and disconnect anything like that and then when I'm done with that there's a nut here there's one back here and there'll be two more on the other side that I will take off and then I should be able to lift the carburetor off of the intake manifold and I will be prepared with a uh, cloth to cover the opening because this is going to leave a big old opening into my intake manifold so I'm going to make sure that that's covered so I can't accidentally drop anything bad into my intake manifold. Okay well, you can see I have the uh, fuel inlet disconnected. I disconnected down below I have disconnected the cable to this crazy manual uh, choke. And then when I'm looking at where I'm going to disconnect here, this is the, the kick down where when you step on it, this whole mechanism here is like a, a, a manual throttle position sensor. And when you stomp on it, 
it tells the transmission that you need to kick down a gear to get up and go and be the rocket that you are. So I'm looking at that and you can see it's all kind of wet there all of a sudden. And as I'm operating that linkage to see where I'm going to disconnect it, and it looks like right there is the spot, I see fuel coming out of this hole right here. As this moves, fuel kept coming out of that hole. So I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to be happening. Oh, that's good. That's something else we can address here and make this car run much better. All right, I have the... Uh, Lincoln chair disconnected and it's just like a cotter pin through uh, anyway and now I have removed all four of the mounting nuts and they were half inch and they were really loose like like barely more than finger tight that doesn't seem right so I have a list of factory specs as far as tightness for everything and I, when I reinstall this I will put this back in with the correct uh, torque specs on these nuts. They seemed way loose to me but I'll double check and make sure that could be part of our problem. So I'm ready to pull this whole thing off I think. Yeah here she comes. All right, we have the carburetor on the bench. It has a plate on the bottom here that you can see is attached to a whole linkage. So I'll probably have to disconnect that. And there's lots of uh, screws holding different chambers together. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this and flake out this instruction manual and see if it can help me out here a little bit. Okay, this it's a little bit intimidating, I'll admit. Uh, all we have here for instructions are this little three page thing that's kind of, uh, looks like it's been copied a billion times, but I guess it's better than nothing. I also have the Oldsmobile service manual so I will be consulting there's a section on that carburetor in the appendix in the back of this but just for the sake of simplicity here uh, I'm going to follow what this says to do and what it says to do is to disassemble a numerical sequence so start at number one which is that little piece on this linkage, number one and number two. So I took off number one and number two, and I'm going to put this all the parts in order, and now the last two pieces I'll put back on will be number one and number two, and then my mounting nuts and the mounting plate. I'm going to clean all of this stuff also. But as I'm taking it apart, I'm just going to keep everything very carefully labeled on all the paperwork here and that way hopefully I can get it to go back together because there's a lot of parts on here and this diagram is not exactly the same as the carburetor I have. It says this is for Carter carburetors models W, G, D and you can see on the end here it says model Carter WGD so we know we've got the right kit for this car but uh, all right so I have taken off five six and seven were my last pieces that I've got already over here labeled seven looks like it's the gasket which this is everything that came in that kit it looks like top right there is number seven this kit cost uh, $50 on eBay. 
Okay, so I'm going to continue on taking this apart in the order it says to and doing this sort of labeling. This could be uh, the beginning of a slippery slope where I end up just actually buying a new carburetor that's already good to go. That I'm prepared to do if my efforts at overhauling this don't work out. I think this is a little above my pay scale, but I'm going to soldier on. So step eight is removing eight screws right here, two, three, four, five, six, and I already took one out. So there's seven and eight. And it holds on this interesting tag. Not quite sure. It looks like it's been punched a couple times. Uh, don't quite know what that means. Uh, if anybody knows what that tag is supposed to be there for or what it means, please say so in the comments. So I'm going to take those eight screws out. And the first one I took out was very loose. Okay. This one was a little bit tighter, but that first one was, like I said, the, like the, the mounting nuts. It was barely finger tight. This one was a little better. Let's see about this one. If I can get the screwdriver in. There we go. Oh yeah, that one, that one wasn't tight at all. It was just barely snugged beyond finger tight. So I'm going to take the rest out. So those were the air horn mounting screws. And then this whole assembly on top here is called the air horn. And that's what I have to separate next. According to this list, the air horn assembly. So I think that's going to take two hands. All right, there we have it. The air horn assembly has been lifted away and it looks kind of nasty in here. I am correct in assuming that this has not had much attention in some time. Huh. Okay. Let me carry on. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, I think this is going to benefit from a nice good clean out. Yep. Boy. Okay. Next. So I've taken out the float. There's a little uh, bar right here. Uh, number 10. That's the little bar that goes across. And the float fits in here. So I remove the float. That's number 11. And then this uh, needle and seat assembly is number 12. And if you look at the rubber gasket on there, it looks pretty messed up. It's like all kinds of misshapen. So, yeah, we have all new parts for that, I'm pretty sure. Okay, number 13 is metering rods, two. Okay, right there. Okay, Let's see if I can see. I guess that would be these. I don't know. Let me see. That is one of the metering rods here. And you can see I have one of them out. And in order to get it out, I had to turn it over and look right here. You can see the end of the metering rod right there. So I can wiggle it here and then I can make it pop off the end and withdraw it from this side. Next, I've removed this larger gasket and I'm going to take out these low speed jets. There we go. Here's something a little interesting. When my next steps here are to take out the pump here, this is the throttle pump, and there's a linkage here which shoves it up and down and I'm about to disconnect this linkage and then the next thing I'm supposed to do after I get this linkage out of the way is remove the return spring 
for the throttle pump. And it's supposed to look like this. Well, there is not a return spring in there. I don't think. Let me take it the rest of the way apart. But I do not see any return spring. No return spring. Okay. Um, now all the more certain that this carburetor is going to benefit from this attention, assuming I can actually put it all back together. <laughs> okay, I'm up to part number 33, which is the metering rod jets. They're down here at the bottom. So I'm going to pull those out. And then next, it's the pump check ball retainer ring. Intake check ball. Okay, I'm just going to keep on going. Look at that. The copyright on this is 1970. Hmm. Okay, I think I've run into my first real problem here. And this is a uh, pump uh, pump intake check ball and down at the bottom you can see the bottom of this hole right here there is a snap ring we're gonna get it you can see it uh, you can't get the light in there there we go you can kind of see it. there it is there's like a, a snap ring at the bottom that holds all of this in and it's pretty far down there, so I'm going to have to come up with some way to, I don't know, I don't think I have snap ring pliers that have that long of a tip on them, but let me, let me see, let me dig some out. Oh, I have snap ring pliers, quite a few varieties, but of course nothing that could possibly reach down into that hole. <clears throat> so what I've decided I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to use a couple of these little hardened picks that were dirt cheap from Harbor Freight. And I can stick one in each of the little tiny holes at the end of that ring way down at the bottom. And then hopefully when I get one in each one, I'll be able to reach in with my pliers here and squeeze them together enough to make that ring pop out because it has to come out. We have to clean this out proper. We can't skip anything. Oh yeah, and I did find the missing pump spring. Of course, it was just in a different spot than my diagram showed. Hooray, it worked. You look down in there, you can see the little snap ring is leaning there on the side. So when I tip this over, that snap ring and that little check ball should come out because it looks like we've got a fresh check ball in there that'll help us get this all clean. And cleaning is what we're going to be up to for a while now. So I've already cleaned the throttle body and I'm just using a brush and a little simple green. I'm using some of this to spray in some of the passages and on some of the worse uh, uh, build up and then I'm using compressed air to blow out any uh, of the passageways when we're done and my next one is going to be this thing I mean look at all the rust in that float bowl that's from uh, that's from ethanol getting water in it and rusting out the gas tank that's why this thing probably needed the whole new tank I cannot believe that they did that whole fuel system and yet didn't bother cleaning out this poor carburetor so hopefully this solves our problem well let's see how much of this nasty stuff i can get out of here okay we have reached the summit and we're heading down the other side everything cleaned up pretty good I have started putting things back together, going in the reverse order. I've made it to here. So I'm going to continue 
to reassemble everything, being very careful to follow all the little instructions on uh, these sheets and, and to make sure that uh, I adjust stuff properly as I go, like the float pole. This is something interesting. Part number 11 won't go in for a while. Usually when you see something like this in anything modern, it's plastic. This thing was covered in all sorts of uh, deposits, and I thought it was going to be plastic without thinking about it. They didn't really use much plastic yet in 1951. This is made out of brass. They polished it up. It's brass that's been soldered together at the seam. So how cool is that? A brass float. Well, I thought it was neat. Anyway, I put this thing back together. I have found another point which could be a big stumbling block, I, I would think. Reinstalling these metering rods, they don't really specify in this diagram how they go or where they go, but they go down through two little holes. Let me get a better light here. They're in place here. So one of them is right here. Let me get my pointer. <coughs> okay, this is one of the metering rods right here. It's already in place. There's the other one right there. And the thing that no one says anything about is the spring right here. There's a tiny little spring, and if you don't notice it, you wouldn't even see that it was... Uh, part of this deal but the metering rod has to have that spring you can see the little spring wrapped around the back of it and that holds it onto the end of this assembly here and it makes it so when this operates everything goes up and down the way it's supposed to without that spring it doesn't move like this so it's a tiny 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 little spring and if you miss it it's not going to work there we have it. It's back together. Uh, the only place I really had trouble was, again, with those two metering rods that attach to the uh, top of this whole assembly here. I had it put together, and I was trying to put the air horn on top here, and you've got a bunch of stuff hanging down. You've got the the float and the plunger and all of that stuff, the pumps. And, and so with all of that stuff dangling, trying to get them lined up, I just couldn't get these metering rods lined up. So I ended up taking them out. They come out from above underneath this dust cover. And then I was able to get this air horn seated. And then I put them back in and felt around until I found the jet and got them to slip down and then put them back on the little assembly uh, through the spring here at the top. But it had to go on. They had to go in after this air horn was put on. So now it's time to try and put it back on the engine. And fingers crossed. I hope this works. I hope it doesn't just gush uh, fuel everywhere as soon as I try the ignition switch. <laughs> well, we'll find out. I think I have it all worked out. Uh, I've hooked up the aftermarket manual choke and I've hooked up everything else. I I, I, I worked out this whole uh, crazy linkage, replaced some of the cotter pins. I think we're good. I'm getting ready to turn on the ignition so the fuel pump will run and let's see what happens. I don't know if you can hear it, but the electric fuel pump is going. I don't see any obvious leaks so far. Okay, well, maybe I'll try and start her up. Okay, hold the phone. I got a leak. Yeah, there's definitely a leak. Doggone it. All right, 
let me uh, shut off the fuel pump and see if I can trace where this leak is coming from. Shoot. Okay, I put the air filter on for backfire safety and fired it up. And I think the leak I had was some sort of an overflow from the float because as soon as I uh, started it up, there's no more leak. Everything is good. I'm going to shut it off and see if it continues to leak with the engine not running. But I definitely need some new fan belts. Those things are looking rough. So, okay, I guess um, I'm going to take it out for a quick drive. I'm bringing a fire extinguisher with me. Oh, yeah. Run it nice. No stumbling, no missing. Just pulling right along like 135 horsepower should. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit more and then I'll see you next time when I fix the crushed seat or the door release that doesn't work from inside. We'll have to see. Thanks for watching.